I see John's name up. Is he on the call? So John Drakenberg, his, he's here, and Kathleen Spillman. So they're both uh, board members uh, for, at Cherish USA. Um, and, um, Rachel and Bev are here representing that uh, original OG team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have Sam and Nicholas and Whisper, um, who are currently in leadership in Uganda. And then uh, Stephanie, she's with Timberline Church, and they've been out multiple times. Um, and then Todd and Glennis, and they've also been out. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, there's everyone represented here is is in deep which is great <laughs> so we'll see who else joins us along the way um and it you know it's december 1st it's world aids day and um it's a day that we just acknowledge that you know that hiv and aids are an issue for a lot of people and that we want to do all we can to fight and stand in the gap for those people and cherish has been uh, founded on that, you know, that's a bit of focus of ours for, for since day one, and will continue to be. And it's also Giving Tuesday. And so there's a lot of organizations that are vying for those giving dollars. Um, and then it, today is actually our 10 year anniversary. Lee and I stepped foot in Uganda 10 years ago today. Can you believe it? Wow. No. Yeah. No. So that's, Where did that go? <laughs> <laughs> like that in a heartbeat. And then five years ago, our hospital opened. So today's our five year anniversary for the hospital. the hospital. So it's a big, That's awesome. Big day. Mm. So that is wow. awesome. So, and how many years is it on the, is it on the December 10th? Is that the, I can't remember that. Seven. We, we've heard six and seven, but so we've kind of landed on seven. Today, I think it's been uh, 13 years mm -hmm. on December 7th. Wow. Man alive. Yeah. It was pretty special to be with the UK team today and Janet, um, Finn and Lucy, Steve, Steve Waldron. Waldron. Yeah. So to just again talk about some of the OG people um, mm -hmm. and then to be with you, Bev and Rachel, to be with all of you, but just the, the historical part of who has laid the foundation, who God laid the foundation through. It's been a pretty amazing day. Yeah. Wow. So cool. Bev, so I've recounted the story that others have as well, but look, real quick, give us how the whole thing started. So it was um, our second trip to Uganda and we had gone to Mild May. And we, we were praying with a lot of the staff. That was our reason for going. But in the process, we were given a tour around what Mild May was doing. And we went into the palliative care section and we were looking at all these people and um, pretty well every patient had somebody with them. But I came up to a little cot where there was a small, a very small girl. She actually was about 18 months old, but I... She looked to me like about four or five months old. And ironically, her name was Rachel, which I didn't find out immediately. But I remember looking at her and feeling completely overwhelmed. She was unconscious and she had that heavy breathing that people have when they're very ill. And I looked at her and I wished I was somewhere else. I, I just felt like I can't bear this kind of suffering. And as I was looking at her, I heard the Lord say to me really clearly on the inside of my heart, you could do something about this if you wanted to. And it was almost like there was a space. You could do something like this. And then if you wanted to, was like a challenge. <laughs> like the Lord saying to me, would you want to if you could do something? And I felt really afraid and I felt overwhelmed and I felt annoyed with the Lord as well because I felt like this isn't fair because I'm already left my home country of Australia to go to England and I'm pastoring a church and we've already got so many faith uh, things to do. We never have enough money and now you, you want to add this, you know, add this to it all. But I went back to England and I spoke to Rick about it. You had a similar reaction. But, you know, when the Lord speaks to you, it's like you have the choice of 
treading on it like an old cigarette butt and just killing it or letting it be there and keep scratching at you until you respond and it kept scratching at me and so I spoke about it one of the mornings that I was preaching I, I was speaking about changing the world ironically and and I just said, if there's anybody interested, you know, I just put that out there. And 25 people came to me after the service and said, I am interested in that. And we held a meeting after that. And it, the thing that was really funny about it was that within a month or six weeks, almost every one of those people who came to that first meeting had disappeared. They They'd left the church even, they, you know, and then we had like about five people. But we knew that it was the Lord saying, you guys can do this, even though you have no idea what you're doing, you can do it. And so we made a beginning. And every time we took the next step that the Lord asked us to do, he would take the next step. Yeah. And so at every point he provided, it was the most amazing amazing journey of faith and i know that with you guys it continues to be mm -hmm. so true. Uh, can you speak to those early months or years um mm -hmm. you know for, for, for those of us who i think everyone on this call has been to cherish you know as it is now or as it is in the last couple of years and mm -hmm. you know god has done amazing work and it was built on the foundation of what happened in those early, early um, days with you on the ground with the team. And we'd love to hear a bit about that. Are you asking me? Sorry, I didn't get that. Okay. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I would start probably with the land and say um, Rick came out, um, Bev's husband Rick, came out with um, Stephen Waldron, who's from the UK, and they, God was just like Bev said, just providing every way, every step of the way, and we ended up after a failed attempt to buy other land, which God saved us from sinking the money that we would have into a complete scam. He led us to this piece of property, and we bought it, and it was scrubland. It was literally, the only thing on the land was a path from the main road down to the water because it's just off the off Lake Victoria and the path goes right to this big incense tree that um Muafu tree and it's not there anymore it's a long story but um that was the village's path back and forth to the tree and to the water and so when we started there was nothing else there except for one tiny tiny Sam will remember this little tiny building that was ant infested and falling apart and we we were so um trying to be so resourceful with the little money that we had at the early days that we renovated that tiny little building and made it our first classroom <laughs> while the guys um while we had uh, two churches give us the money to start building homes for children with HIV. And so that was a very exciting time because we're building the homes, we're anticipating kids coming on site. Sam was our first teacher ever, ever hired from outside of our, um, of our expat team that had come over. And uh, he joined the team and they taught four kids in that tiny little classroom. And it was just amazing because we would stand there and we would say, well, one day there's going to be a huge school here. Or one day we're going to do this. And one day we're going to have, you know, the facilities. And we had like no money in the bank account. And we had all these visions and all these dreams. And God was like so passionately leading us. It's almost like that didn't matter that we didn't have the resource because we knew the next step, just like Bev said, the next thing he was right there ahead of us laying it out for us. And we would just, have to like take a step and and it would all come in place the people the the ugandan team that he brought to us the finances the children the partnerships with other organizations it was really a, a very groundbreaking time i'm very excited to be a part of it and i like everybody in the team was kind of a part of every part of the organization yeah I'd be busy doing you know, counseling with kids in their family homes. And, you know, we would just be all doing everything um, in those early days, which is totally what organize, how organizations start. Um, 
it was just unbelievable to see even like getting our non-governmental status we were told that it could take years and years and we we just had favor with god and with the ugandan the ministry of health and the the non-governmental the ministry of children's welfare and people just were surprised to see what was going on and we just kept it's because god is doing it like we're just following and just listening and just doing everything that we can. And our team was very mixed um, with skills, which is incredible. Again, just people putting their hands up to say, I'll go live in Uganda. We had like every kind of skill that you would need to build the team. Straight, right off the get-go. It's not like we had 10 carpenters and no nurses, you know. <laughs> we had a great nurse, a great special needs school teacher, an incredible architect, and a, a guy who led our building team. We had... Um, a finance person. We had all the key components of, of what you would need to put a team together if you had to try. And those were people that God had tugged on their hearts and put together. And everyone just brought the gift that they had and served so faithfully in those years. And it was crazy. Wild <laughs> <laughs> <A lot of> times. <laughs> but it was it was really fun because we could see, you know, we brought the first children in and like, oh my goodness, now we're really responsible for the lives of these children. And it stretched our ability to coordinate with lots of different services that were available in Uganda and lots of partnerships were built. And when kids got sick, we would pray for them and, and do everything in our power. And for years and years, not one child died. It did have a child die and we have since, but um, it was like God affirming, like, this is a real, you know, a true vision that I've given you. Like, the lives of children are, are preserved and are tested with HIV not being a, a death sentence, you know? So, really amazing times to see God work. May I add to that? Yeah, because I saw something from a, a, a distance, and that was we made a decision to always walk in integrity before the Lord. And so there were Christian organizations there that just went ahead and built their buildings without getting permission, permissions and went ahead and did certain things without permissions. Mm -hmm. But I know that Rachel and the others went and sat for hours and hours and hours in government department offices waiting to be seen by the right person at the right time and not take a shortcut, but always do it right. And I believe that the government looked on us with favour because they saw that we didn't see ourselves as separate and above the government rules, but that we respected the government and we respected their rules. And so each of the processes that were undertaken, every one of them, even if it took longer, we, we made a decision never to give a bribe. Those things were really important to us. And so I feel that that in many ways, the Lord did so much for us because of this determination to do, to do it his way and to do it with integrity, as well as with love and as well as with sacrifice and so many of the other things that accompany most mission um, endeavors. But this was to respect the government. And I, and I know that it was sometimes very frustrating and we also saw so much prayer into it. And we didn't, um, we, we, I mean, we really started with no money. And I remember as a church, we got together about 15,000 pounds to buy that, that land, but it was 65,000 pound, the first amount. And Rick texted one of the guys who was a businessman and said to him, you know, would you like to contribute? And he wrote back and said, we think about, 5,000 pound and Rick, Rick said, I was thinking more like 50,000. And the guy swallowed hard and found that 50,000. So it was always like faith and integrity working together because if this is what the Lord said, we could do it his way and he would supply. You know, it, it's interesting that those same principles are still alive and well. You know, we, we are... 
And, and Sam can tell you because he's the guy who walks into those government offices now and years and years and years of doing business that way has been great. Because, oh, oh, you're cherish. Oh, of course. Yes. Okay. Right this way. Like, it's, <laughs> it, we, oh, that's we wonderful. We experienced that a lot. Um, you know, we, it, and I, and this was a few years ago, but there was someone from Wakiso District with, with buildings. And he said, you are the only organization in Wakiso District that has every building permitted and follow all the NEMA rules. Wow. I mean, we, and for, the, for reference, Wakiso District is a huge district that is like a donut around a smaller district of Kampala, which is the capital, yeah. or is the main wow. south. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge, huge district. Same, yeah, those same principles, we still function. And, uh, you know, yeah, we don't pay bribes. We follow the rules. And it's frustrating and a pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, we have stuck to that. Mm -hmm. and, um, Great. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting that from the very beginning, those same, you know, God gives you just the next step and just enough resources for the next step. And that's how it continues to be. <laughs> and you walk on Cherish now and you see all these buildings and all the staff and all that. And this, we don't have loads and loads of money in the bank. <laughs> it is just based on, we just still have enough to keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Wow. Every, and it, yeah. And we've, we've never missed payroll. There's been days where it's like, how are we going to do this? But God always shows up, you know, and that's unheard of for an organization in Uganda to never miss payroll for that many years. Yeah, wow. true. Remarkable to watch God continue to work. And from the very beginning, all the way till now, the mm -hmm. same, he's still doing it the same Thank way. You. Yeah. Mm -hmm. awesome. Can I add something about um, just the mission of Cherish? Mm -hmm. Started, I remember going and meeting with the guy that would basically certify us to be a children's home at the Ministry of Children's. Uh, Sam, what is it called? The Ministry of, it's not children's, but I can't remember the name. Is it uh, um, welfare or something? Um, it's. It may have changed. Ministry, Ministry, of, social, Ministry of Gender and Social Development. Thank you. Thank you. And I remember sitting with him and, and explaining our mission and he, he was really abrupt. He was a very um, busy man. And I'd waited so long to see him. And I sat in front of his desk and, and when I got the chance, I was so nervous because I'd been waiting for all this time. And then when I got in front of him, he looked so uninterested in anything I was trying to say. I was nervous because so much rested on us being approved by this, this gentleman. And he looked at me and he said, tell me again, what's the importance of what you're wanting to do? He said, I've got, his desk was covered in papers. He said, I have 600 non-governmental organizations for orphan and vulnerable children sitting on my desk, and that's just in Kampala waiting to be approved. What are you doing that's different in all of these? And I, I remember thinking, <laughs> but I actually knew that we had a great answer. And I said, we're not just taking any children, we're taking children who are HIV positive, and we're working in relation with you know a great medical provider who's already you know very well esteemed in Uganda and we're, we're in partnership with them and we're taking these children in and no other of the organizations that are on your desk will receive these children and the hospital is having to let them die because there's nowhere to place these children and we are filling and he just looked up at me and then he said what's the name of your organization <laughs> And he looked at the paperwork and it's like it the paperwork got put on the top of the pile you know because there was something unique because god had called us to something that nobody else was doing and i still like you know just god had had it us pegged for that reason for that time for this time and it's amazing to see that guy approved us and you know now to see what you guys are doing i know he would regret and, and obviously we know God was in that so pretty awesome yeah for sure well a key thing that we want to do moving forward is uh, maternity at our babies uh, in our village because there are um, many many moms we see prenatal and then we see them postnatal and they're on their own when it comes to having babies um, 
Sam, can you speak a bit to, to why we need to grab a hold of this as an industry? Thank you, Brent. Um, we do uh, have mothers that come, as Brent just talked about. And all we do is before they give by the prenatal and then after that. Um, but because we are in a community of uh, fishermen and there's so many women and girls in, in the same area that one, people are very ignorant over so many different things. And so the, the clinics are um, in the area, small little places that sell drugs and medicines. Are, um, these people try to run to such places or many of them, um, many of the mothers that are pregnant um, would prefer to even have someone help them give birth at home. And with the mothers that are living positive, chances of um, this mother infecting the baby are very high at birth. And so because we as a hospital have also been um, working with people that are living positive uh, almost on a daily, um, it's very important that we go on to even support the mothers at a time of birth so we can stop these infections from these new infections that uh, would come in through um, uh, the mother giving birth. And so we think that, um, that, that the different places that these mothers have gone to to give birth, uh, there's still risks that are, are there uh, because many of the people that are helping them are not qualified. Mm -hmm. And so um, the fight against HIV, um, will continue uh, and many babies will continue to be infected if uh, these mothers don't give birth uh, in hospitals or in places with people that are qualified with people that can actually help them very well. Um, with mothers who are living positive, the team has always followed up on many different occasions. What we don't do is, have, is our, our, when it comes to a time when they need to give birth, we actually tell them we, 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 we don't offer that service. And so they have to go and try a different place. Um, the government hospitals that are close to us, are far away in Entebbe town, uh, which is about, um, it's about 15 to 20 kilometers or even more than that. And it's, these places are always packed with so many mothers from all over. And um, you walk in there, you will actually see some mothers just laying on the floor, pregnant, laying on the floor with no, nothing on the floor. They just laid there. A uh, few people, medical uh, personnel that are actually helping them out. And those places are overwhelmed. Many of the mothers from this other side where Cherish is, the communities around us, would even find it difficult to even go to those places because of means of transport. Um, and then um, there are no services around that the government would continue to provide far down this other side to try and stop um, such kind of uh, way that mothers continue to give birth. So we think that if we as Cherish started to offer maternity then it's a continuation from the services that we're offering, um, offering the prenatal and helping these mothers give birth and even supporting them after they've given birth uh, with many other different services that we are already doing, like immunization of the children. Um, Nicholas over here is, um, is a midwife. So he, he, his profession, he's a clinic officer, but he, he's also qualified in helping mothers give birth. And so we think that um, Nicholas and the team of, of people would be very, very great um, at helping us move into the next step of making sure that uh, we are stopping these other infections. Um, we've had times where mothers, um, we, we've offered to take mothers to other places where they could go and give birth late in the night. And it's, it's very different. Um, I have uh, I've driven different people to uh, places 
um, far away from here where they need to go and give birth. And risks are high that this mother could even give birth in the car mm -hmm. as you're traveling. Chances of death are also very high because no one is there to help. And so we believe that with us being in the community and being very close, having people that are qualified to do the work, we can save lives um, of mothers dying as they give birth. We can save um, babies from being infected at the time of birth. Um, yeah. Nicholas, yeah. So when, if a mother can't give birth, if she's in our village and she has no means for transport and we're not giving, we're not providing that service, I'm assuming that those mothers are just having those babies at home. Um, like um, most of these mothers, uh, they don't have an idea on, uh, on antenatal. And, and so, and most of them have not been attending antenatal, they get pregnant. For them, in their mind, they will go to attend to these traditional birth attendants. Mm -hmm. They go to drug shops, they go to clinics. Um, and so they come in the late stages of giving birth. And because we are not equipped so much, the only thing we can do is to refer them where they can go. And, and they don't know their HIV status. And so there's a high chance of transmitting this HIV to the babies. And what we do, we've been following them up, uh, giving them phone calls, interacting with those drug shop owners, clinics, uh, see that these mothers, after giving birth, they come back for the test. Um, that's what we've been doing around. And imagine if we can get a hold of these moms before. And because we have such a focus on discipleship, we're not just there to provide a service for a baby and a mom, but we're there to, to, to help them connect with Jesus through the process. Mm -hmm. And I think it's amazing what we can accomplish because, yeah, these, these young girls and these, they, they don't go to anybody. All of a sudden, they need to have a baby. And that's the first we hear about them. And then we do all we can on the back end. But imagine if we can start providing those services on the front end, which would be amazing, mm -hmm. truly, truly amazing. And, and, and we have our own staff. I don't remember Margaret, farmer Margaret, who you just watched her get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden the next day she shows up to work and she's carrying a baby. You're like, Margaret, what's that? Oh, it's my baby. <laughs> really? Yeah, I had it at home last night. <laughs> it just... Even our own staff, like we couldn't provide anything at can't at the moment, which is terrible. Um, and, you know, uh, Leah's been to many births and situations there in Uganda, and they're, they're really hard. They're really hard. You know, speaking into what Sam said um, about emergencies happening the night, I've been in one of those cases, and the mother called, there was someone in the community who called and said, hey, Cherish, are you able to help? There's this mother who is badly in pain and she needs, she needs help. And uh, I talked to the lady and she seemed very helpless, you know, and just alone directing you where she stays. I'm like, how do we even get there? Because mm -hmm. now looking at where she was and up to the hospital, I was like, how do we even save this life? So now I had this thing that if we really had these services, it would be very, very easy just to pick her from where she is or that the team could just go with equipment and see how to help her in that state. But now the only thing that we had to offer was transport and looking around for transport and then taking her to hospital. It was, you know, because with birth, it's just a few seconds and you never know what could happen in between those seconds. So by the time we took her to hospital, thankfully she gave birth and in the morning she called and she was so, so grateful and I'm like, oh my goodness, if we could actually offer all the services like delivering this baby within the community, that would have been something so helpful. So I think it's something that we need to work towards because if we are able to stop the spread of HIV and through birth is one of the ways, then I think it's something very crucial to go with. As these other people that are already infected and you see also they have their own package, but if we are able to eliminate HIV right from birth, then I think it's, it's a route that we should actually take. And would you use the same building that you're using now? Is that equipped and, and able to provide the space for that? Yeah, yeah, we were assuming we needed to have a phase two for maternity, um, but the government was actually coming to the training um, 
recently. And they said, we're actually doing you last of all these in the district and you are the best, which is amazing. But why aren't you delivering babies here? Mm -hmm. Come on, people. Like they were- <laughs> They were starting to point to that room and go, that room could be that and that room can be yeah. that. And, <laughs> and we were like, wait, we thought we had to build a building. And we just like, um, nope. ended up hiring a doctor on Monday and I had the privilege with Nicholas to sit in those interviews. And the one that we chose to go with um, is someone who works at a government hospital and she's in gynecology and labor and delivery. And so mm -hmm. fishing in cesareans and, um, and she's just like, I'm hoping I can come and use my giftings here. And so it really has sparked within us that I think maternity is going to be a specialty for us. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he's been laying that on our heart, but now it's just like, I think it's time it's to and to watch who God brought us. It's just, it's been amazing. And she, it was one of them, Nicholas, I can't quite remember, but one of the three doctors interviewing that day. Um, and I think it was Dr. Florence had said the relationship that is built between a mom and a doctor, when you're going through all of that, and if our heart is for discipleship, and we know discipleship is based on relationship, there's no better place to start than, you know, in this, in this journey. And then they come back for their immunizations, and, and it's just this continual continuation. And so we just want to, for so many reasons, we believe that this is going to be our new focus is a maternity ward. And now to know that we could do it right where we're at like who would have thought you know no, so we're, we're actually just putting our toes in the water to figure out is that dream really going to become a reality well it's definitely become a reality it will it's just the timing the timing of it is the issues which is why we're all gathered mm. having all of these gatherings because we do need money to make it happen you know we have beds to buy and you know equipment to buy baby ventilators i was meet with a doctor here and um who wants to help us put together a plan. He's like, you got to figure out. We have to have all these protocols in place. What happens when a, when a baby comes out blue? Like blue, yeah, when they're not breathing. We have to have everything we need. I mean, we've been at those births in Uganda where babies have come out not breathing and there's no oxygen, there's no equipment and those babies don't make it. And we, we got that. Mm -hmm. And we have the opportunity to do that. So. That's why we're gathering these groups together to raise some money to be able to start pushing those things forward. And you know, the beauty is that God continues to be faithful as we just keep taking that one step at step a time. By step. So <laughs> that's what we're doing. So for those of you who listen to the recording, you know, you, if you go to cherishuganda.org backslash W A D, all lowercase, that's where money directed towards um, maternity will go. And the beauty of the beauty, one beauty of Cherish and finances is it is it all goes to Uganda. Like we have very small overhead um, it, anywhere else, very small. And so it's really unique in that, you know, mm -hmm. we're sitting in the Cherish Uganda US office, which is our dining room. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and we're in all of our funds to support us is raised separately. You know, that doesn't come from people that are, you know, giving money towards Cherish. And so the, the money that's raised tonight will go towards making this dream happen, which is really, really awesome. So, what do you need? Well, what do we need? We need, we need money and we need prayer. Mm -hmm. Those two things, probably in the opposite order. We need prayer and <laughs> And it sounds like you guys have already prayed. So, so what, do you have a dollar amount or? <laughs> well, you know, we're hoping to raise a thousand dollars at each of the events that we have. Um, so that'll put us around $15,000 and that'll give us a good step forward. Um, you know, but it's a, uh, it's so much of it is unknown as we're stepping in. We have some, um, you know, some building things we'll need to do. We have equipment we need to buy. Um, we've just hired this doctor that's going to be fabulous. Um, so we have pieces in place that are already working and then we have some stuff we got to make happen. So, um, yeah, so it's one of those things where if someone gives us $50,000, it will be spent. If someone gives us $100,000, it will be spent. 
Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's just, that it, that'll just determine the scope. Whatever we get, that's as many steps as we take. And we'll mm -hmm. keep stepping. But the ultimate dream is to have a whole labor delivery ward. Yeah. yeah. That'll, you know, that'll cost about a half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the dream. Um, but with, should someone want to step up and right. do that? We'll take it. We'll build it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have EMI has already drawn up preliminary plans for that. So mm. we are, we are taking steps towards the end goal as well. So mm. they're, they're a great uh, partner that is mm. on board and ready to go when that happens too. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. We're at. So please, um, if anybody has any questions, if you know of anybody that, you know, conversation with um please direct them our way it's a it's a pretty good bang for your buck chair shiganda you know there's a serious amount of discipleship and love and care and results that come from what god's doing there mm -hmm. and um it's 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 a pretty amazing as you all know thing to be a part of so mm -hmm. We don't want people to miss out on the opportunity. You know, mm -hmm. we're not here to twist people's arms and, you know, guilt them into anything. But we're mm -hmm. here to say this is an amazing opportunity. You mm -hmm. should. You don't want to miss it. Mm -hmm. And get people. Here. Brent, um, when you said that you're looking at about a thousand dollars per each of these events, and then you said fifteen thousand dollars, what other events are you doing apart from this call with? Uh, this U.S. call and the U.K. call. What other events are you There's, doing? Uh, I think it's thirteen other small group things that are happening um, around this day. Yes, yeah, so like Stephanie. Day. I think she already did hers. Um, Todd and Glennis are doing one Saturday. Yeah, yeah. And they're just kind of small because we can't do a large event. So we thought, why don't we do these small kind of COVID friendly? Do them outside, small numbers. Um, so they'll have a a video that they will play that kind of lay out the vision and ask them for money. And the host just brings people there and provides a little theme and has a party. So that's, that's what we're doing. And do you mean even beyond these events, like how else are we raising money or were you just talking about? Uh, well, I'd be interested in that, but I was just talking about the 15 events because I was thinking, okay, I was trying to work out what else was happening. Yeah. Uh, this was it. Yeah. So there's the two calls and then, so basically these two calls were kind of the, the let's, let's get one of these recorded and get something that we can kind of push out to people who weren't at any other events. Mm -hmm. so, right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Brent, could you talk a little, could you talk a little bit more about what the, you would do with the $15,000 or if you got 25,000, you know, that, I mean, what more could you do with that? Yeah, it, it, it's all based on, the key thing is based on equipment. So um, like we have $9,000 raised for an ultrasound machine, but the one we want is 15. So um, we can buy the one for nine now, um, you know, but it's, uh, it's kind of like driving a 20 year old Toyota Corolla, where if we get another six grand, we're gonna be driving like a, a new Toyota that's gonna last a long time, mm -hmm. you know, it's that um, there's beds to buy. There's these mommy kits that are required for every mom to give birth. She needs these supplies. Um, there's staff to hire, um, birthing beds. You know all the things that you see in a in a birthing center. We obviously don't need all of that, mm -hmm. but we need quite a bit of it if we're going to give the best quality care that we can. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we want to be able to strap that mom up to a sonogram and see that heartbeat mm -hmm. and monitor her when she's there. Um, we, we want that kind of equipment mm -hmm. and unfortunately that kind of equipment is not cheap mm -hmm. and um, it's difficult to even bring it from here to there. So if somebody says, I have a sonogram machine, here you go. Well, it's, it's not as easy as that <laughs> uh, to, you know, to get that to cherish. So there's taxes involved and shipping. And so there's, there's lots of, lots of expenses that roll in. And then there will be some, probably some building things we'll need to do that we'll need. And EMI is ready to do those. They said, whenever you're ready, just tell us, we'll, we'll go. So, but we have to pay materials and we have to pay for the labor to do that. So they'll do all the design work and manage the project, but we will have to do some retrofitting to the building. Mm -hmm. 
You know, when just in my experience, which it could be um, have changed since I was in Uganda, but when it, even that a hospital that Sam was talking about in Entebbe, which is uh, out of reach for some people, especially when you're trying to have a baby, um, and and also I think there's a private hospital a little bit closer. Neither of those major hospitals have an ultrasound machine. Mm. Back in my day, they didn't. And I remember having a young girl who needed an ultrasound to determine whether her full blown baby was alive or dead. And we were sent from the government hospital to a tiny little clinic and had to pay a fair amount of money just to have an ultrasound to find out that the baby had died. So like having that at Cherish as a, a location point is incredible. Just that service just for preening you know, just all the things. <laughs> I, I very personal because I'm pregnant right now and I just today had an appointment and was talking about when I'm gonna have my next ultrasound and now hearing this it makes me feel like, oh man, I remember how out of reach an ultrasound was, how expensive it was. And you guys would serve so many people. You'd have people from Entebbe even coming. Yeah. Like the the radius is wide for services like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's really really exciting yeah 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 and we're, we're, we're trying to do which is really even goes back to what's been done at the beginnings of cherish is we want to provide what's not being provided mm -hmm. there's there's no reason to just duplicate what's already being done um we're really looking at education and going a whole kind of this new route that's a whole nother discussion about education and mm -hmm. um, this computer training we're doing and kids coding and like some really awesome stuff because there's a massive hole in the market and nobody's doing it and we can. And again, God keeps providing what's next and the same here with eternity. There's a, a big hole in the services and we can step into that spot and people can hear about Jesus in the process. And we, we don't wanna miss it. No. Do you have a, a date that you would hope to start doing that? like delivery side of it because it sounds like you're already doing nicholas is already doing quite a bit of the pre and post mm -hmm. yeah there's a um there's a few key things that we're waiting for the government to say this is what you have to have to call yourself the health center three and mm -hmm. then once that list is met we tick the box and we start having babies so <laughs> that would be a great day <laughs> and we would have for shouts of joy and mm -hmm. There will be many photos of that very first baby that's born outside. We'll name her Cherish. <laughs> <laughs> what if it's a him? Cherish it is. <laughs> Girls. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's going to be great. So, thank you guys for joining Brent? us. Yeah. Go ahead. I have a question. Sorry, everyone. I'm late. Um, I was doing my World AIDS Day gathering. Um, but a question I had, and I wanted to ask this earlier today in the event with mostly our UK donors was for RISPR actually. Um, and maybe you guys already discussed this tonight since I was late. Um, but is, we discussed how Cherish has progressed and how we're already changing the story and we can all see that um, with the work being done with kids that we know. Um, but I guess when you go out to new families, uh, some of like Finn and Lucy were discussing uh, how parents and families neglected HIV positive children and how we don't see that as much anymore um, is kind of what we talk about. But Risper, do you think families are changing? Like are um, they seeing the hope for children that are HIV positive or is there still a lot of learning to do? You're muted, Risper. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Right now, uh, with the community that we have, 
with awareness that has been going out, people are kind of getting to know that now having a positive child is not the end of the world. Like they have a hope for tomorrow. And it's some of the things that the government is trying to do, the ministry is trying to put out this awareness. And somehow now where we were like five years back is not where people are right now. Like there are those changes that, that is happening. And it's also one of the things that the social work department is trying to do, which is the mindset changing. Not back those days that we just come and deliver, but now it's the whole of the mindset changing. Like I have these resources, I have this piece of land, what can I do with it? So it's mainly the mindset changing that we are trying to work towards, that if someone has this child and you find maybe a, a, a grandmother has this baby and they're thinking maybe probably this baby won't last any long, how are we going to help this grandmother? Not just saying that, oh, we have this art clinic, we have these services that we can provide at Cherish Health Center. What more can we do for this grandmother? The whole mindset changing is one of the gaps that we have realized is still there and it's what we are working towards. So, but at least with the statistics, there has been a reduction in that now. Wow. I want to encourage, especially the OG group, is that when we started the school year in 2020, um, prior to then closing our school once COVID came, we went out into the community to make sure we, we really looked at our classes and our numbers and we wanted to, to make sure that we were still reaching out to the kids that were HIV positive and then in the vulnerable category. And we were searching high and we were searching low. And when the social work team would come back with their reports, it was astonishing and we were like some in, in some ways it was hard to find kids at that time who were positive and we're like well where are they and then it was people that began to say it's because of the work that you guys have been doing for five years educating the community taking care of the community that actually it's it's working it's <laughs> it's, it's really changing the story and it's changing what is happening with mindset. And we have a long way to go there. But to actually find, like we thought it was crawling. Our, our pregnancy was crawling and it, was, it wasn't as true as we thought. Mm -hmm. And it, is, it was a testimony to what God has done these 13 years at Cherish. Mm -hmm. Whether through first education or five years ago when that, when we started our hospital, y'all, it is astounding it is astounding and then we began to go woohoo glad we can't find find as many as we thought mm -hmm. lots of vulnerability but not always hiv mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah mm -hmm. that's pretty cool yeah. yeah and so cherish continues to pivot based on where the needs arise mm -hmm. our focus is still jesus and discipleship and first and foremost kids with hiv mm -hmm. and you know then there's those not only infected but affected by HIV as the circle widens and we continue mm -hmm. to now not just deal with the ch child but deeper investment into the family mm -hmm. you know social work is really about family strengthening now how do we strengthen mm -hmm. the whole family mm -hmm. um, like Risper said it's not just about art it's not just about getting the medicine mm -hmm. um, about the mind and the yeah, heart yeah so yeah it's, it's remarkable. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say something about the fact that you're going into maternity now. I remember Rachel telling me a lot of years ago about how one of the women on site was having a baby and having difficulty and Rachel took that young woman to the hospital and Rachel was going to pay for the, um, for the medical fees. And while they were there working that out, another woman came on the back of a motorbike, came in. Do you remember that, Rach? Came in and was having a lot of difficulty having her baby, couldn't have her baby. And, uh, and, and she needed a cesarean and they sent her away because the cesarean was going to cost $320 or something like that. And Rachel was already paying for the other woman and didn't have any extra money. And the woman went away into the night. And um, one of my daughters-in-law has had three pregnancies and each one has had to have a, a last minute cesarean for that, for that reason. And I've, I've prayed for that woman so many times that Rachel spoke about, 
because the story was so horrifying to me. And I don't know, Rach didn't know what happened to the woman and I didn't either, but I, I suppose I want to make it really clear to everybody in the West that's listening to this, that it's not as easy as just something else will get worked out. It's, it's not like that. You could die because, because you can't go to a hospital, to have your baby. And, um, and this is just such a good work. This is, you know, wonderful work. It's, it thrills my heart that Cherish has come to this and continues to enlarge, envision and, and values the Ugandan people the way God values them. It's just overwhelming. It is. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say once I got myself together that whisper, we had a meeting. I, it must be, it was, I can't remember the year, but it was probably 2008. Maybe. We had been taking in children, but I hope you can hear me because my connection is a bit bad, but okay. Uh, okay. We had, we had done a similar thing as Leah was talking about. We had sent our nurses and social workers into the community and gathered information on all the children that needed help, specifically HIV positive and vulnerable. We sat in meetings for days, two or three days as a team of social workers, nurses, myself, and the person heading up childcare. And argued that person and, was uncle risper and, and the reason we know risper is because uncle introduced us to risper mm -hmm. so she, oh she cool yeah. augustine was a very big part of that those meetings <laughs> and the reason it struck me so hard is because our decision was down to we created this scale of how vulnerable is this child and we could only take the most vulnerable and there were awful awful cases that didn't meet the criteria uh, for us to take them in because there were so many and so sure that there's not many i mean we labored over those children and and wished and prayed that there weren't so many people augustine used to come to me all the time and say we have to make more room because these two children, we can't decide between them because whoever we don't decide on is going to die. That was like, that was an everyday pressure, you know, and just to hear you say that you've gone and looked in the same exact community and you can't find, and it's like a different world. And it's just, I just praise God for the work in there and the work you guys are doing because it shows people that, these children are not just to be left vulnerable and dying. They're, they're credible people <laughs> that have a future and have such hope. Very inspiring. Yes. Wow. And actually, like the way Brent said, um, it's hard now to find those that are infected, but now those that are affected with HIV. And that is now like kind of the route now. Because now those that are infected are already like under care. So now how do we help those that, that are, I mean, those that are infected are already under the care and somehow they have the help. So how do we help those that are affected? So now you go into this community, yeah, you're going to get this positive child. And somehow maybe because of the awareness that has gone on, people are adopting to that and the kids are doing well. But now how do we help those that are affected by HIV AIDS? You find like maybe the parents died and the, with the grandmom, the child is negative, right? But because of what happened, somehow the child is living in a vulnerable state. So somehow now that is the road that we're taking those that are affected with HIV AIDS. So that is thanks to God that at least now the infection rate is, is going down and the awareness that is being spread. So if now we can do the maternity and we eliminate at least the infections at birth, then I think we'll, we'll be doing great in the near future. Mm -hmm. Wow. So great. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it is uh, about time for 
you need to go to work in Uganda. It's about time for the rest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so uh rachel can you pray us out we'd love to father we just thank you so much for your presence and your the fact that you are the alpha and the omega you see the beginning all the way through and to the end and we can sense and, and know by your holy spirit that there is so much more that you have a head for cherish in these next years and the the heartbeat towards women having babies and reducing the infection rates of HIV and all that you've laid on Brent and Leah's heart and Sam's heart and the team that work at the medical clinic, the social workers. Father, we just pray that you would now just use us as your people to spread the word, to to give our, ourselves to to be advocates and ambassadors for this vision and what you're going to do into the future. And just as we've talked about, Father, we just thank you that you have brought to, to reality the things that you placed in our hearts that were just a dream, even though we looked around and had no resources. And we trust you at this junction to do the same thing, that we look around and we see the need and we see what you're putting in our hand to do and we don't necessarily see the resources in the accounts to do it but we know father that you have the people that you have the cattle on a thousand hills and that you are leading and guiding and we just speak into this program and this possibility father that there would be health and wellness safety and love and discipleship around one of the most miraculous things you ever created childbirth Father, we just ask that you would just bless this team, bless each person, bless and favor, cherish before the ministry of health and, and all those who would make the way possible for them to be certified and, um, and be able to offer this to women just like that woman that turned up at the hospital and turned away and shouted her way out of the hospital. Father, we just ask that you would just allow church to stand with open arms to women like that. Father, we just bless and bless this team of people working tirelessly for this vision and this cause that you have breathed into life. And just thank you for this time we've had together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. So good to see you. Thank you. So great. Thanks for getting it going, um, Brent and Leah. It's just been such a delight mm. to be able to revisit this. It's wonderful. Thank you. It's been Thank great you. hearing from everyone. Yeah, it's been awesome. Mm. All right. Well, thank you for your all time, and we need to we need to do this again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> right. we should. <laughs> all right. Thanks again, team. It's nice to see you guys. <laughs> Lovely to see you, Sam. Mm. Nice. To Yep, you too, Nicholas. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Have a good night. I remember meeting you when we right. were in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was a few years ago, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you as well. <laughs> okay, take care. Thanks so much, Brent, Leah. Yeah. Bye.